I've been asked to comment on Chairman Bernanke's first two lectures. And um, what Professor Fort was saying before is that basically it's a very unstructured format. I wasn't really told what, what to do or what to, uh, you know, how to present here. So what I've done instead is, as I've looked at the questions you've asked, I attended the lectures, and so I've come up with some comments. Um, and I am willing to take questions during the talk, and there'll be more than enough time at the end to, to answer questions. So I hope that you'll speak up and make this an interesting dialogue. Uh, one of the aspects of his lectures that I really enjoyed was um, that he provided a, an overview, a historical perspective for economic events. And I thought that was helpful in looking back at what's happened during the financial crisis. Um, and I, I think it's a really a good time to step back and, and have a longer run, bigger picture type perspective on, on what's been going on. So to do that, I'm going to start off with a graph that uh, the chairman presented in his fourth lecture. And I think he mentioned that this is one of his favorite graphs. And for lots of macroeconomists, it's, it's one of their favorite types of graph to look at. Um, this is over 100 years of data on real GDP measured in 2005 dollars. And in this graph, um, the dashed line represents a constant growth rate. So the, the uh, vertical scale is in logarithm, so that a straight line represents a constant growth rate. And then in the solid red line, you have real GDP. And you can see that you know, we've trended along, around this long run growth uh, curve you know, pretty much over the last 110 years. Um, you can see some substantial deviations from that uh, that long-run trend during the Depression. Um, some other things I want you to notice about this graph is that we've been very slow to re return to that long-run growth trend uh, in the aftermath of the latest financial crisis. Um, other things to notice is that we've had business cycle fluctuations, recessions during the entire time period. Recessions are indig indicated by that shaded region. Um, and you can see that recessions have lasted for very long periods of time. Um, they've been very short. We've had um, expansions that have lasted long, long periods of time during the 1960s, during the Reagan administration in the 1980s, during the Clinton administration in the 1990s. Um, you also should notice that the duration of a cycle, the amount of time from peak to peak, where you've gone from uh, an expansion into a recession has, uh, is highly variable. So we've had some double dip recessions that have been very close, as you can see in the early 1980s. We've had long periods of these expansions, and I just mentioned a few time periods. Um, the amplitude of cycles, and that can be measured by the deviation of the, uh, the solid line from the dashed line that measures the severity of, the, of a cycle. The amplitude is really varied over time. And in fact, if you were to take this graph back to the 1850s, which is about the time when the National Bureau of Economic Research, another institution that the Federal Reserve Chairman mentioned, that's when they started dating business cycles, you would see that we had, would have, um, if you extended it back, a, a graph that looked pretty much like what you see from the 1900s to the 1920s. Frequent recessions, um, high growth, probably higher growth than what you're seeing illustrated by this long run trend line. But right now, I want you to, in particular, just remember these two close recessions that occurred at the end of the 1970s and right at the beginning of the 1980s. The most important thing that comes out of that graph and the most important comment that I'm going to make today is that policies that focus on promoting long-run growth are much more important in terms of the, the welfare effects for Americans now and in the future that um, much more important, many orders of magnitude more important to focus on policies that promote long-run growth than to focus on policies that uh, help uh, to prevent business cycle fluctuations. And I think that's an important point to realize now in the aftermath of this financial crisis. Another way to say it is that an economy growing strongly can weather a recession much more easily than an economy that has weak long-run growth. So this is an important thing to realize when we're talking about setting policies right now, that instead of just focusing backwards, looking backwards on what to do to prevent the, the, uh, another financial crisis, we should be trying to understand why we're not having 
more robust growth, why this has been such a weak recovery. <coughs> Now, another point I want to make is that the Federal Reserve and the financial sector play an important role in raising or increasing economic growth. The Federal Reserve can help to increase economic growth by maintaining stable prices and by ensuring that uh, financial markets work smoothly. I also want to mention that the financial sector plays an important role in promoting economic growth. I know the tendency right now is to really vilify the, the financial sector, and certainly the excesses of the financial sector become apparent over the financial crisis. Certainly, if I look at how much money, uh, income, those the people on Wall Street make and compare it to my professor's salary, I certainly get outraged. So I, I certainly understand that. But I do want to emphasize that the financial sector plays an important role in promoting economic growth. You know, Jobs and Wozniak wouldn't have gotten out of the garage with Apple if it hadn't been for a venture capitalist. We have some important biotech firms like Genentech, for example, that relied on financing from a, um, from a venture capital firm. So the financial industry does play an important role in helping uh, in promoting long-run economic growth. And in particular, growth in a de developed economy like the United States comes from growth in productivity. And productivity growth, growth depends on innovation and research and development. And getting those eyes from the, uh, ideas from the research stage into the marketplace requires financial backing. And that's where the financial sector comes in. So when we're talking about implementing policies, Dodd-Frank policies right now, and, and regulating the financial sector, I think it's important to remember that the financial sector does play a role in promoting long-run economic growth. Um, or business cycles occurred before the Federal Reserve System was created. They were, have occurred after the Federal Reserve System was created. It, they've occurred under different monetary regimes. Um, and from 1850 to the Civil War, we had privately circulating banknotes. So this is a private supply of, of uh, money supply. Then after the Civil War, we were on the gold standard, and we had a national currency. The gold standard was lifted sometime during the Depression. And since that time, we've basically had what we call a fiat currency system, meaning that the US dollar is not backed by any, any kind of commodity. It, it's intrinsically worthless, and it has value because people accept it in exchange. So we've seen business cycles under all different types of monetary regimes, and before and after, we've had central banks. It just seems as if business cycles are a recurring feature of industrialized uh, market-based economies. Now, the Federal Reserve has as a goal to try and minimize the amplitude and duration of business cycles. And there's evidence to suggest that they've been you know, successful at that. Uh, but it's very unlikely that a, the Federal Reserve will be able to un, uh, completely eliminate business cycles. Uh, the, the, Chairman showed a picture, um, two, two graphs actually, on the variability of real GDP and inflation during two time periods, the 1950-1985 time period and the 1986-2007 time period. And you see that the, in those pictures that the variability of inflation and real GDP has dropped. And the Federal Reserve probably can take some credit, not all of the credit, but, but some of the credit for that drop in variability. I, I, qualify that because it's very hard to determine causality in macroeconomic events. You can't run controlled experiments like they can in the hard sciences. So you know, econometricians have to work hard to try and figure out causality. Um, there are major disagreements among macroeconomists on what causes business cycles. And if you've taken an intermediate macro class, you would spend a good part of the semester uh, discussing what causes business cycles about half the semester on that topic, the other half on what causes long-run growth, what are the determinants of long-run growth. But there are major disagreements about what causes business cycles. And of course, if you want to prevent or mitigate the impact of a business cycle, it's helpful if you know what causes it. So macroeconomists are frequently ridiculed by other economists because we can't answer a basic question like what causes a business cycle. I also want to point out that financial panics have, um, that uh, have occurred before the Federal Reserve was created, and they've occurred after the Federal Reserve was created. We've had financial panics um, under different monetary regimes. 
when we had private bank notes, when we had the gold standard, and under the current fiat money system. So again, financial panics and, and financial disruptions seem to be another typical feature of industrialized economies. And again, we can probably have policies to mitigate those kind of financial disruptions, but probably won't be able to completely eliminate them. Financial disruptions um, sometimes cause recessions, sometimes they don't. And the chairman mentioned several financial uh, crises or disruptions. Um, for example, the stock market crash in 1987. Um, there was no recession after that, that, that stock market crash. Um, he mentioned the uh, dot, uh, dot com bubble, the boom bust period during that led to a mild recession in 2001. And finally, we've had the financial crisis of 2008, and there we had a recession. So sometimes financial disruptions cause recessions or coincide with rec uh, recessions, and sometimes they don't. There are two extreme views about what causes financial panics. On the one extreme, you'll see um, there's a view that financial panics are self-fulfilling. Right, that they're driven by psychology and they're unrelated to economic fundamentals. So we call them sun, uh, sunspot equilibria because um, just an extraneous event can set off a financial panic. So an example of what I'm talking about is a rumor might get started that a bank is in trouble. And there may be no substance to the rumor, but if everybody believes the rumor, then the optimal response of agents is to go and, and withdraw their money from that bank and it becomes then a self-fulfilling prophecy and the bank does go under. So just the psychology, uh, just a rumor can set off this event. So the view is financial panics are, are, are the result of um, a lack of stability in the financial sector. At the other extreme is the view that um, downturns in an economy tend to coincide with financial problems. So if you have a weakening in an economy, uh, you're moving into a recession, asset prices start to fall, and so that weakens the asset side of the balance sheet of, uh, of a bank or financial institution. Investors who don't have complete information about the quality of the assets that a financial institution are holding become concerned about the, the quality of those assets and want to withdraw their, their, their money. So. Uh, what happens is then you have a financial panic or a financial disruption. But in that case, it is related to um, weakening in the portfolio of the bank's, uh, bank's assets. So I just wanted to say that there are these two extreme views and lots of views in between. And I think in the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear people talking about these different views. Again, this is an area where economists, macroeconomists in, uh, in particular, disagree. Are financial panics driven entirely by psychology, or are they related to underlying uh, economic fundamentals? We have observed recessions with no financial panics and financial disruptions without recessions. Um, there is some evidence, and I do have a, a bias uh, here, um, but there is some evidence supporting the view that an economic downturn increases the likelihood of a financial crisis. If Financial, if, if the economy is, is weakening, unemployment's rising, asset values are falling, the stock market's falling, that does tend to weaken the value of assets and securities, loans that banks and financial institutions are holding, and that causes the concerns uh, about the, uh, the solvency of the institution. Financial institutions are inherently fragile. They provide this function of asset transformation. They tend to uh, lend long and borrow short. And providing that function, providing liquidity, does make them uh, prone to uh, runs and, um, and, and bank panics. Despite the lack of definitive answers to the questions like what causes business cycles. Yeah, question, Noah? Yeah, um, why is it that there's a feeling that it has to be one or the other? Well, I was just giving you the two extremes, and there are views in between. And in particular, there's the sort of an in-between view is that you may see you know, a business cycle fluctuation moving into a recession, 
asset security prices, asset prices are falling because of asymmetric information, incomplete inf information about the quality of the assets that a financial institution are holding, risk-averse uh, investors will decide to withdraw their funds. So that sort of lies in between the two. Um, so it's, I just want to present, there are those two extremes, but there's a continuum of views in between. Um, so despite the lack of clear answers about what causes business cycles, what causes financial panics, financial disruptions, how are the two related, it became clear during the 1970s that expectations were important. And the chairman mentioned uh, this several times, that there was a surge in, in inflation in the 1970s. And inflationary expectations made it very difficult for policymakers to get inflation under control. And this is a quote from uh, Bernanke's slide seven, lecture two. Starting in the mid-1960s, uh, monetary policy was too easy. The stance led to a surge in inflation and inflation expectations. Inflation peaked at about 13%. Now, there were several efforts during the 1970s to break the psychology of inflationary expectations. And what you see here, this, this is a picture of a pin of, from a campaign that was started during the Ford administration to try and beat the psychology of high inflation. And um, it's whip inflation now, win. And the idea was if everybody just made an effort to change their expectations about future inflation, that uh, we could just you know, change it. Um, and you might be surprised to hear that this effort didn't work, uh, wearing a pin and just didn't change inflationary expectations. So um, the way we got to this very high inflation and high unemployment during the 1970s um, is important in understanding how inflation expectations were formed. So during the 1950s and the 1960s, um, there was empirical evidence demonstrating that there was an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. Okay, and this empirical relationship has been called the Phillips curve. And what I've drawn here is a, is a picture of the Phillips curve. So on the horizontal axis, I have unemployment. And on the vertical axis is inflation. And if you take observations of inflation and unemployment, say quarterly or yearly observations for 10, 20 years, and you run a regression, so you try to fit a line through that scatter plot of points such that you minimize the sum of the square deviations from that line, you'll end up with something that's a downward sloping curve like what I've drawn in the picture here. This suggests that there's an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. Now I'm denoting inflation by the symbol pi and unemployment by the obvious symbol u. If you see a superscript e there, pi e, that denotes expected inflation. And the super, and U superscript N denotes the natural rate of unemployment. And what that natural rate of unemployment is measuring is unemployment that's not the result of a business cycle. So it's measuring things like seasonal unemployment, structural unemployment. It reflects demographics. Unemployment rates tend to be higher among younger people than older people. So this is the kind of unemployment level we would have in the absence of any kind of business cycle recession. So you can see that based on the expected inflation and the natural rate of unemployment, there's this trade-off. So I, the way that I learned about the Phillips curve in one of my classes, it was kind of it's very similar, but a little different in that it had production on the x-axis, and then it had a positive relationship between higher inflation and higher production. Is that just like another interpretation Right, the higher production, the lower unemployment right. in general. And so I'm just right. you know, making it really, it's the same thing. Okay. Exactly. It's just I put unemployment on the axis because it makes it very clear what the trade off is because it's this negatively slow function. Yeah, no. Uh, what's the last variable that was a plus? Is that a V or a U? That's a V, and that's just an um, unspecified supply shock. So if I were to actually plot the data here, you'd see that the data don't lie exactly on this Phillips curve. They'd be close to it. How do I explain that difference? I just add on an error term. So that's all that is. All right, so you have this inverse relationship. And um, this is actually was 
um, estimated by an economist whose last name was Phillips, so we got the Phillips curve uh, named after him. Um, and we see Phillips curves, this inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment, in a lot of com economies where you've had low and stable inflation. With this Phillips curve, uh, policy uh, makers thought that uh, the curve captured a stable relationship or stable trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And so basically, economists took the Phillips curve to policymakers, and through an election, you might decide you know, what kind of trade-off you wanted. Maybe Democrats would prefer to have low unemployment and higher inflation. Republicans might prefer to have lower inflation and higher unemployment. So through an election process, you, know, you could decide where you wanted to be on the curve, and economists would tell you where, what kind of inflation you had to have to ha achieve a certain unemployment level. What happened is that when policymakers tried to use the trade-off, say, to increase, increase inflation in order to lower unemployment, the result was an increase in inflation and no decrease in unemployment. So every time they tried to exploit this trade-off between inflation and unemployment, the Phillips curve kept moving. And it turned out that this relationship uh, was unstable. And it was unstable because expected inflation kept changing. So what happened is they kept trying to lower unemployment by raising inflation. Inflation rates started to rise. Unemployment was rising. And so we ended up the 1970s with the high inflation and high unemployment called stagflation. And what was realized during the 1970s is that there's a feedback loop in expectation formation. That expected inflation depends on monetary policy. And that monetary policy depended on expected inflation. If you look at that equation for the Phillips curve, notice inflation <coughs> depends on expected, in, uh, expected inflation. It also depends on the level of unemployment. And if monetary authorities are conducting monetary policy in order to reach some point along this Phillips curve, it's going to feed back into expected inflation. So there was recognition that there was this feedback loop and that in order to implement policy, you had to understand how expectations were formed and what kind of expectations uh, people had of what the policymakers were going to do. So what happened at the end of the 1970s during the Carter <coughs> administration, Carter named Paul Volcker to be chairman of the Federal Reserve System. And he had as a goal an announced policy that uh, he wanted to lower inflation. And so he implemented tight monetary policy. And the result was those two recessions that I mentioned at the end of the 1970s and the early 1980s that I asked you to, to notice when we were looking at that graph of long run uh, real GDP growth. Um, it turned out to be very difficult to break inflationary expectations. People didn't believe that the Federal Reserve was actually going to adhere to a policy of tight tight money when unemployment was going up. Now the chairman said at least three times that I, I kept count of that um, the actions of Volcker and Greenspan had made his job a lot easier <coughs> because people expected inflation to just stay low and, and, and um, stable. And so what I want to talk about is how difficult it is if you get into a bad cycle where you have high inflationary expectations, how difficult it is for policymakers to, to uh, regain credibility of policy and have, have people believe in announcement. All right. So um, before I get to, I'm going to write down a simple game. Yeah. Um, I asked this question to the chairman uh, last week, and um, I, I still don't understand why um, the fact that a lot of money has been pumped to the market, inflation expectations haven't risen. Um, he, said, he mentioned what you mentioned with that Volcker um, and previous Fed chairman stabilized uh, confidence in the system. But I, I still don't understand why inflation expectations theoretically wouldn't rise, given that there's more money in the economy and that price levels would rise as a result of that. Um, it, I think he told you that was a great question. I think it's a, a good question, too. I'm going to answer it differently in a way that the chairman probably couldn't answer. Right now, um, they've purchased all of these assets, and they've expanded the, the size of the Fed's balance sheet. They haven't printed a lot more M1. So where is it? It's in reserves. And there are a lot of excess reserves in the banking system right now. And banks have been reluctant 
to lend out those reserves. They are basically, the, the Federal Reserve is paying interest on excess reserves. Um, so banks are getting that interest. They're getting interest off the Treasury securities that they're holding. And they've been reluctant to lend to the private sector because there's uncertainty about if you, if you give a loan, are they going to be able to pay it back? So they're just holding on to that money. So basically something we call the, the money multiplier is really uh, very low right now. It could change quickly. And, um, and that's one thing I don't think the chairman wanted to talk about and he didn't talk about, is that if inflation expectations suddenly jump up, it could be that banks decide to, uh, to get rid of all these excess reserves and just start lending them out. And money, given the size of the monetary base, the, uh, the supply of money, not just you know, M1 but M2, could increase rapidly. So, um, so you, you notice he was very careful to emphasize during the Depression that he felt the Federal Reserve um, tightened monetary policy too quickly. And he wants to make sure he doesn't repeat that mistake. But he's, it's a bit of a tightrope. They, they want to make sure that inflation doesn't start surging. And if you follow the financial news, you'll see that every once in a while, there, there will, particularly in the Wall Street Journal, be concerns about how much money, how, you know, the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and how quickly inflation could rise. So he doesn't, didn't want to talk about that. But, yeah. Do you think that decrease in like the velocity of money from the financial crisis could have caused deflation? And that's why it necessarily hasn't caused inflation? Well, I think, I think that's a, a distinct possibility, and I think that's one reason why the Federal Reserve increased its the the reserves so dramatically during the financial crisis and and pumped in so much liquidity is that they wanted to make sure we didn't get into a deflationary <coughs> spiral. And you know, deflation in and of itself isn't a problem. It's when you have a lot of contracts that are fixed in nominal terms. If you have deflation prices falling, then the real cost of those contracts paying back a loan goes up, and so def deflationary you know, spirals can be can be dangerous. And central banks, including you know the one run by Bernanke, will do everything they can to prevent those kind of spirals. So, but velocity, um, the money multiplier could suddenly increase, and they they're keeping an eye on those uh, variables very closely during the FOMC meetings. Other questions? So I want to talk about expectations formation, which is actually a, a kind of a difficult topic to, uh, to be precise about. So I want to actually, I'm going to try your patience and, and put up a, um, a game between the Fed and firms in a minute. But I want to um, talk about what policies have to make, have to worry about when they're implementing policy. Um, um, if you are implementing a policy regarding a natural event, all right, something like uh, implement, you know, flood control measures. If you have a river that floods frequently, you decide to uh, go ahead and build a dam. Nature's not going to change its behavior in, res in response to your building a dam. It's going <coughs> to rain the same amount whether you build the dam or not. So you, that's easy to make a decision. Then you just do a cost-benefit analysis and decide whether or not you want to you know, implement flood control methods. If you implement a policy on rational agents, if you want to assess the impact of that policy, you have to make a forecast of how agents are going to respond. So for example, a lot of people who work in Washington, D.C., live in Maryland or, in, or Virginia. If the state of Maryland raises its state income taxes relative to the state of Virginia, it has to take into account that people can easily move to Virginia and out of, out of Maryland. So if they want to figure out how much tax revenue they're going to get after, from raising income taxes, they have to take into account that some people will leave the state. So they have to take into, the, into account the response of agents to the policy. It gets a little more complicated than, than that. I mentioned that feedback loop that can occur. The response of agents to what policymakers do may depend on what they think policymakers are going to do. So it creates a strategic interdependence. And that strategic interdependence, um, I'm going to talk about a particular example called a time consistency problem. 
A policy announcement is time consistent if the policymaker has no incentive to deviate from the announced policy. And I'm going to argue that one of the reasons we had these two severe recessions in the early 1980s is that Volcker made an announcement that it was going to lower inflation. People didn't believe him. And in order to get to break that inflationary um, expectation cycle, we had to experience these two difficult recessions in order to build credibility for the Federal Reserve System. And so to illustrate this, the, the easiest way I can think of is actually to put up a game. So I hope that you can see this. So this is a game, a one-time game between two players, firms and the Federal Reserve System. All right, And each player has two choices, two kinds of strategies that they can implement. Firms can raise prices. That would be the first column. Or they can leave prices the same, not raise prices. The Federal Reserve can increase the money supply. That would be the first row. Or they can leave the money supply the same. That would be the second row. Depending on which, which combinations of actions the two players take, you can get four possible outcomes. So there's outcome A, B, C, and D. In outcome A, which is the box on the upper left, um, inflation would be, say, 10%, and unemployment would be 6% if firms raise their prices and the Federal Reserve increases the money supply. If the Fed kept the, increased the money supply and firms kept their prices the same, you would get outcome B. And under outcome B, inflation would be, say, 0%, and unemployment would be 3%. Outcome C, when the firms increase their prices and the Fed keeps the money supply the same, you would have inflation at 10% and unemployment at 9%. And finally, outcome D, where firms don't raise their prices and the Fed leaves the money supply the same, you would have inflation equal to 0% and unemployment equal to 6%. Now associated with each of those outcomes would be points for each of the two players. And I've just made this example up, but I want to illustrate a point about expectations here. Um, if you have outcome A, where inflation is high and unemployment is at 6%, the Federal Reserve gets a, a negative 1. And firms get 2 points. So if you add up the total points for both players under outcome A, you have 1. Under outcome B, if uh, where you have inflation equal to 0% and unemployment equal to 3%, the Federal Reserve would get two points and the firms would get one point. So if you add up the sum of the two, uh, the, the points to the two players, you'd have three there. Outcome C, where unemployment is 9% uh, and inflation is 10%, that's the worst outcome for the Federal Reserve. They would get negative two points. Firms, um, would get two points. So if you add up the, the total points for both players under outcome C, you'd have zero. <coughs> um, and finally, outcome D, uh, the Fed would get one point and firms would get three. Any questions about the basic information? What the Federal Reserve has to do is to think about uh, how firms are going to uh, respond if they say increase the money supply. So let's look at the first row. If the Fed announces that they're going to increase the money supply, what is the firm's best response? Where do they get the most points? Anybody see this? From uh, raising prices up on A. That's right. So if the Fed increases the money supply, firms are going to respond by increasing prices. If the Fed holds the money supply fixed, how are firms going to respond? Outcome D. Yeah, outcome D. That's where they get three points. Now, let's suppose that uh, firms are going to increase their prices. What is the be Fed's best response? So firms are going to raise prices. When is the Fed? What is the Fed going to do in response? Increase 
they're going to increase the money supply. That's right, because they're going to lose only one point there where if they hold the money supply fixed and firms raise prices, they're going to lose uh, two points. Finally, if firms don't raise prices, all right, so that last column, what are, um, what's the Fed's best response? Yeah, they're going to increase the money supply, so they're going to go to outcome B. So notice what the best uh, response to Fed policy were firms, and um, will depend on you know what the Fed is doing, and, and at the same time, the best policy for firms will depend on what they think the Fed is going to do. Now, the best outcome for society meaning the, the outcome that has the most points would be outcome D, where you have a total of four points. Now let's suppose that the Federal Reserve announces that they're not going to increase the money supply. So that's a policy announcement. Uh, we've already determined that if the Fed announces they're not going to increase the money supply, that firms are best off if they go ahead and keep prices the same. Right, so you'd have outcome D. But given that firms don't raise their prices, what's the best response of the Fed? And that's to increase the money supply. They're going to move to outcome B. So the fact is that despite the policy announcement, the Federal Reserve has an, um, an incentive to deviate from their announced policy. They announce they're going to hold money supply fixed. Firms believe that, they don't raise their prices, the, the Fed has an incentive to deviate from that announced policy. So the policy announcement that they're not going to raise the money supply is not time consistent because the Federal Reserve would have an incentive to deviate from that policy. Yes? Why are firms better off in outcome D versus outcome A? If they are able to raise prices in line with the increase in the money supply, shouldn't they be the same? Because there's higher inflation, but they've increased their prices. They're, they're better off than under maybe some other outcomes, but I just made these numbers up. Okay. So basically, I just these are just made up numbers to illustrate, illustrate a point. So the first point I wanted to illustrate is, is what a, a time inconsistent policy looks like, that you'd have an incentive to deviate from an announcement. All right, so that's the first point. The second point is people, the firms know that the Fed, the Fed will uh, deviate. They're not stupid. They'll un understand that the Federal Reserve, despite the announcement, would have an incentive to deviate. They're going to anticipate that. And so if the Federal Reserve is going to increase the money supply, we've already determined that their best response would be to raise prices, to move from uh, B to, to outcome A. So despite the announcement by the Federal Reserve that they're going to keep the money supply fixed, <coughs> firms figure the Fed will deviate from that announced policy. Given they're going to deviate from that, that announced policy, their best response is just to raise prices. So it turns out that the equilibrium, and it's called a Nash equilibrium, is outcome A in this simple game. You may have heard of John Nash in, in the movie A Beautiful Mind. This is. You know, in the movie, I guess it wasn't really a Nash equilibrium, but this outcome A is a Nash equilibrium. Given what the other player does, this is the best response of, for each player. So this is a Nash equilibrium. Notice that the first best outcome is outcome D. That's where everybody, the society's welfare is maximized. You get in a sum of four points there. The worst outcome is outcome C you're going to end up in outcome A, where you have basically society has one point. So now, suppose you have a Federal Reserve, like the Federal Reserve under Paul Volcker, that makes an announcement, has, has no credibility, and <coughs> wants to make sure, you know, wants to create credibility for the Federal Reserve system. So think of this as a repeated game. This is just a one-time game. If you think of a game that's repeated, you may be able to build up a reputation or credibility for Federal Reserve policy. What happens is if you want to build up credibility, you make an announcement that you're not going to increase the money supply. The firms aren't going to believe it. They're going to respond by raising prices. 
And that would put you in outcome C. If you actually stick to your policy announcement, you're serious about uh, not, not uh, deviating from the announced policy, you're going to end up in outcome C, which is the worst outcome. And you can view these two severe recessions that we had in the early 1980s as, as ending up in outcome C, where to break inflationary expectations, we had to go through several time periods of having a bad outcome in order to build up credibility of the Federal Reserve System. All right. So when Bernanke said that his job was easier because of the policies of Chairman Greenspan and Volcker, this essentially is what he's referring to. He, Volcker walked into a situation where inflationary expectations were high. The Federal Reserve didn't have any credibility because policymakers had been basing policy on a Phillips curve. That Phillips curve was unstable. People kept changing their expected inflation. So they would raise inflation or increase the money supply. You'd have inflation, and unemployment would not fall, and it even went up. So in order to break those kind of um, expectations, Volcker had to uh, tighten the money supply, and we had to go through these two, two difficult recessions to make it credible. Um, so, so I just wanted to illustrate formally what, what Bernanke was saying when he, he said that Volcker and, and Greenspan had made his job easier. So does um, credibility change between chairman? Is there like, evidence of, of it um, being completely dictated by the institution itself? Or in a change in leadership, there's a bit of a change in uh, It changes depending on the chairman and on the composition of the board of governors. Uh, it changes with the uh, voting members of the FOMC. I think the chairman mentioned that you have four voting presidents of different uh, Federal Reserve banks. Um, the fifth is always the, uh, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And um, you'll see that these, these presidents of these district banks have very different views about inflation. So depending on the composition of that, that committee, you can see that the, uh, the perception of whether they're inflation hawks or doves and, will really change, and that will impact the credibility of, uh, of, the, of the FOMC in a policy announcement. So I'd say yes, it does make a difference. Yeah. Um, I learned uh, from my macroeconomics class that the Friedman rule advocates a nominal interest rate of zero um, to have no opportunity costs between the spending and holding money. Um, that would apply uh, in outcome D when there is maximum societal welfare from this that it wouldn't there wouldn't be necessary deflationary pressures, but there would be zero inflation. Why why hasn't that been advocated as opposed to an inflation rate of two percent? I think that um, the cons the concerns about trying to maintain basically zero nominal interest rates and implementing the Friedman rule when you have a lot of indexed or you know, nominal contracts. There have been concerns about how you would implement that kind of policy. Also, I think there are time consistency issues. Would you maintain that kind of policy if unemployment goes up? Wouldn't you, you know, there would be a big incentive to try and uh, use expansionary monetary policy to try and uh, bring an economy out of a recession. So, um, there have been lots of discussions and lots of theoretical models that economists devise that demonstrate that the Friedman rule is optimal. But once you start incorporating uh, more realistic assumptions like uh, <coughs> frictions, uh, asymmetric information, it ends up that um, it's not always optimal. So other questions? So I wanted to put the time consistency in an problem in another way, and that's introduced a little concept of time here. That, um, and it, this applies to some of the comments the, the chairman made actually at the end about Dodd-Frank. And that is thinking about time consistency as it applies to an announcement of no, no more bailouts in the future. Thinking about the too big to fail problem. Suppose you, uh, you make an announcement 
that uh, you're not going to have any more bailouts, that the too big to fail problem, that you're going to have a whole different approach to it. You have to think about the credibility of that policy and how do you build up credibility. Because you'd like to have the policy believed. If, if financial institutions believed there would be no more bailouts, there would be no more too big to fail, they would then change their behavior and take on less risk. And so the hope would be if that, that announcement's believed that um, you're going to lower the probability of a financial crisis or of a financial panic. The problem with that kind of an announcement is that if you do have a financial crisis, given that the event has occurred, it turns out to be optimal for the Fed to intervene and to, to go ahead and, and bail out or to pursue a too big to fail policy. And so trying to build credibility for that kind of policy announcement is going to be very difficult for the Federal Reserve System. And part of what you can think of as Dodd-Frank Dodd doing is trying to create an orderly liquidation um, process in the event of large firm does become insolvent, that firms, financial institutions will believe is credible. Because if it's, if it's viewed as credible, then they're going to take on less risk and lower the probability of actually becoming insolvent. But I just wanted to mention that part of what Dodd-Frank is doing um, is, is trying to shape expectations on the part of the financial sector of what kind of future bailouts or, or policy in the event they have financial troubles, what that future policy will be. So they're trying to craft expectations in a way that they take on less risk. I started off talking about the history, um, a historical perspective on business cycles, financial panics, on the uh, importance of focusing on long-run growth and policies that will help to promote and increase our growth rate. That in terms of importance, that's, that's really much more important for the long-term welfare of the, of the United States. Much more important than focusing just on the last financial crisis or the last recession. Which is not to say that the, the problems and the suffering during a financial crisis or a recession are, are to be ignored, but that in terms of order of magnitude, it's much more important to think about policies that will help promote long-run growth. I ended up with a, talking about a very abstract concept called time consistency. Um, but it <coughs> actually turns out for policymakers that reputation effects, credibility of policy announcements are very important in determining the effectiveness of a policy. So one of the things that a, the chairman has to do, the secretary of the treasury, the head of the FDIC, is they have to, have, they have to be able to manage expectations. <coughs> credibility is very important. Um, you can think of that orderly liquidation facility of Dodd-Frank so as a mechanism to try and build Federal Reserve uh, credibility um, about the too big to fail problem. So thank you. Um, I'll take questions now. Yeah. Um, so one of the most interesting things I thought uh, Chairman Bernanke discussed was his defense of the low interest rate policy from the beginning of the decade, saying that that wasn't a contributing factor to the bubble. And I know a lot of people disagree with that. That's right. Um, so I was curious, based on your research and, and the things that you've read about it, what are your thoughts on, on the low interest rate policy and, and its contribution or, or lack thereof to the housing bubble? I think the chairman um, obviously was going to had a, had a point of view to push on this, but he, he did mention that um, we saw housing bubbles um, in you know in Sydney, Australia, in Spain. There were there were um, housing bubbles around you know different parts of the world. Um, we did see a you know sort of a glut of savings in the world. There's a lot of in terms of demographics. There's a large fraction of the world's population that are is in that age where they're saving a lot. So. Um, those factors in and of themselves probably would have led to lower interest rates. Now, did the Federal Reserve keep interest, interest rates too low? Certainly you'll see people like John Taylor at Stanford saying that you know, it was below the Taylor rule, what the Taylor rule would have predicted. Um, and there are many different 
points of view about this. And what you'd like to do is, is to be able to run an experiment. What if they hadn't had interest rates so low? What would have happened? In order to do that kind of an experiment, you, you know, you can't have a controlled experiment. We can't turn history back, change the settings, and then see what happened. We'd like to, you know, we have to, we have to construct models and then simulate, estimate, and, and try to figure out what happens, but our answer will be only as good as those models. So the bottom line is I'm kind of hedging and saying I don't really have an opinion because um, I've seen people who, whose research I respect very highly come up with very different answers. I don't think that we'll ever probably have a clear answer. Depending on your political perspective, you'll already come up, have an answer that you can use it you know, econometric techniques to, to uh, confirm, so. It's one of the frustrating things about macroeconomics is that you don't get clear answers, you don't have a control, you can't run controlled experiments. So if you come in with a prejudice, you can probably find a way of confirming it. So, yeah? Uh, you, mentioned that, you mentioned that a fiat-based system works on a lot of trust. Um, let's say, for example, the U.S. continues to get downgraded further, uh, less trust in the dollar and, and the fiat system in total. Um, what what would be a response uh, to that to that crisis? Because and another question to that is how much do economists attribute the great moderation to um, the fiat based system or the institution of the fiat based system? Well, fiat currency works as long as uh, you don't print too much. We've seen hyperinflations where governments resort to raising seniorage revenue by print, you know, turning on the printing presses. That's unlikely to happen in the United States. Um, so right now, the US is kind of a reserve currency for the world. And it may change depending on the economic strength of the United States in, say, 50 years. But probably for the foreseeable future, the US dollar will continue to be valued you know, as a, as a reserve currency. So it probably, unless we had a huge burst of inflation, and um, the, the US dollar will probably continue to be valued and trusted. Um, why might we have a surge of inflation? Well, if the US gets downgraded, it's very expensive for the Treasury to borrow if we have high deficits, and the, the cost of servicing that interest debt go up dramatically, there would be um, of an incentive to, to print more money to help pay for that. So, and in fact, countries, Argentina, for example, have had that kind of problem, that their inflation's been caused by deficit weakness <coughs> in their, on the fiscal side. Um, I would never rule that out for the United States, but right now it looks like a low probability. Um, although there's certainly demographic issues and, and budget issues that the U.S. has to worry about. Well, the the your yes, there would be that incentive, but you have very <coughs> different types of members in the in the European Union. You had Germany, which is the dominant economy, and experienced a hyperinflation between World War One and World War Two. And they have very low tolerance um, since that experience for having higher inflation. So you might see that there would be other countries in the, in the European Union that would like to have a much higher rate of inflation because it would make uh, lots of adjustments in their economy easier. But so you're going to have some squabbling about it. Um, and since Germany is the dominant economy, I would guess they might win. So. Could you say sort of that the game that the game that what we just went through applies in the same way to Greece as it does to you know future bailouts of U.S. corporations because you know my understanding is that the Greeks a lot of them a lot of people weren't paying their taxes they were borrowing uh, excessively and that they had a number of chances to kind of solve their problems and they didn't do it so shouldn't the ECB just let them you know default or or is it just the systemic nature that they don't want to let that happen? Um, I think that's a really nice application of the, of the simple game that we just put up, that um, you can make a policy announcement that you're not going to provide any more bailouts or uh, 
um, any more funding that you're going to let them default and hope then that they'll change their behavior, start paying taxes, for example. But if they don't believe it, if they believe that uh, regardless of what they do, if they get close to default, you're going to step in. They're not going to change their behavior. So I do think it's directly applicable to that example. But isn't the main issue that the Right, a lot of time bailouts are not for the people of the country, but for the uh, the investors who are holding the debt. And that, they that's, did default. <laughs> well, they did default. That's right, partially. Yeah, they did. So they had big write downs. Other questions? So uh, at the very end, you talked about too big to fail. And uh, that's something we hear all the time over and over and over again. And I think that it overshadows the other problem, which is too interconnected. Uh, and that was primarily what happened with AIG. They were also, of course, they were, I, they were labeled as too big to fail. But I think people didn't label them as too interconnected. And I think that's a big problem that isn't really solved by Dodd-Frank. And I'm, I'm not sure how you can really solve it. Um, so my question is really, what, what type of regulation or steps can be taken to prevent this sort of too interconnected problem, especially as the world becomes more uh, interconnected and intertwined? And uh, it, it, I think it's just going to become something that's going to be more prevalent over the next few years. That's a great question. Um, I think part of the problem with um, what we saw, say, with AIG, you mentioned that example, was that at a point in time, nobody knew exactly what their net position was. So the whole trading in that market was very disorderly and chaotic. And that was something that um, the chairman didn't mention. But, but back in 2005, when um, Tim Geithner, who's now Secretary of Treasury, was president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, he tried to he didn't have the authority to enforce this or impose it on them, but he was he tried he re recognized that these credit default swaps were a time bomb. I worked at the Federal Reserve System, um, the Board of Governors, in 1990 to 1995, and I remember at that time the finance guys at the board saying these things could really blow up, and so I think a lot of people knew that credit default swaps were were potentially a time bomb. And they do help to hedge against risk, and, and you probably can't prevent them. But forcing a more orderly way of trading through perhaps a clearinghouse or, or something, so there's more transparency on exactly how the risk is being shifted. The chairman mentioned that there was this concentration of risk that policymakers were unaware of at one point in this talk. And one way to try and address this interconnectedness problem, and interconnectedness isn't a problem in and of itself. It's a way of diversifying risk, of sharing it and shifting it to those better able to bear it. But um, if you have more transparency, you know where it is. You know exactly what your net position is at a point in time. That certainly will help raise red flags earlier rather than later that there may be a problem. So do you um, believe that Dodd Frank accomplishes that with the clearing houses for derivatives? And I know what the intention is. I don't know how it's going to be implemented yet. And um, we can have the laws on the books, but if they're not enforced or if they're not well implemented, they won't really have the effect that you want them to. And I think the jury's, it's, it, jury's still out on how well Dodd-Frank will work. Um, but I, I just want to emphasize, I don't think interconnectedness is necessarily a problem because it is a nice way of sharing risk and diversifying. There's lots of benefits to interconnectedness, including specialization, all the standard things you probably heard about in a basic economics course. But I think transparency and, and having full information is probably um, one way to address it. Yeah. Going off the same question, doesn't interconnectedness increase counterparty risk? And and you kind of see that become more of an issue. It increases practice. counterparty risk, but um, if if I know exactly what your position is relative to other traders, I can if I had full information, I can assess the probability of a risk, determine a price, and then decide whether or not I want to pay that price. But if I don't have that information, I can't correctly price the risk. So I may underestimate the amount of risk I'm taking by having you as a counterparty and then be surprised. Um, so having more 
transparency, accountability will probably help. Um, Doesn't more interconnectedness kind of almost by definition make it less difficult to get full information? It makes things more complex. Yes, there's trade-offs. Right. I, I, I agree with there are trade-offs. I just don't want to say we should all live Robinson Crusoe right. style. We can make sure we minimize interconnectedness by, by you know, closing the borders and stopping trade and things. Those are natural instincts, but I don't think they're beneficial. I have to also say the financial sector, a lot of these instruments are shifting risk around. It's not very good at dealing with um, aggregate risk. You can't diversify against aggregate risk. And that's one of the things that happened in these credit default swaps is that you had this correlated event where you have downgrading and, and increase in default rates of a lot of a lot of companies at the same time. And so that that kind of risk can be shifted around but you can't diversify it away. So yeah. One possible way to guard against uh, a huge problem caused by that kind of risk be to allow more mild fluctuations in the economy rather than trying to keep it completely smooth, but allow <coughs> it to have its bounds and uh, allow some risk to, to cause you know smaller failures rather than allow the risk to build up and cause bigger failures. And if, if we were to take that kind of a policy position, what would that look like from the government's perspective, say? I think that the Fed and the government is more than willing to have a small bank fail or a small financial institution fail because, and you know, the FDIC will, they, as the chairman mentioned, will close a small bank down on a Friday and, and have it reorganized with a new name on Monday morning. So they do allow small institutions to fail. Maybe widening the band a little bit as far as the, the kind of deviations and failures that they would allow so that... I think the problem is on the upper end. Right, it was too big, it's too interconnected that uh, it, you know, its failure will lead to the failure, this kind of contagion effect. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is coming out of the Basel Accords is that, um, and is an idea that's been tossed around here is, um, and is implicit in parts of Dodd-Frank, is the idea of increasing the capital asset ratio. Having you know, being less leveraged means that if you have, um, you know, the, a fall in the value of your assets and it has to be written off your balance sheet, you've got that cushion of capital. And you can just write that down so that uh, you, you don't fall into insolvency. So, you know, trying to limit leverage ratios might be one way or uh, for large, for very large institutions that are deemed too big to fail, making them pay basically a tax by having to have a higher capital asset ratio. Yeah, Miles. Um, addressing the issue of the, the, the CDS market being tied to uh, sort of perpetuation of systemic risk in the financial system, uh, specifically as related to the, to the law between AIG and Goldman in the current crisis, um, would you agree that to some extent, not unlike a number of other financial products that have come under scrutiny in recent years, the mortgage-backed security, the CDO, uh, et cetera, that people are focusing uh, on the product uh, to sort of d direct the fall as opposed to the execution of the product. So, for example, most people don't comment on the fact that the amount of CDS that was written on the mortgage market as a whole, uh, never mind the small percentage of that that was written by AIG, is actually a very small percentage of the larger market. And there's been CDS outstanding on sovereign bonds for, <coughs> for, for decades. So, um, in the example of Greece, we also spoke about, um, there was a good deal of commentary out there that said, uh, though now we know that the credit default swaps on those contracts were eventually triggered due to the mandatory push through of the default. Uh, there are a lot of people saying that if you don't allow them to do that, you're sort of negating their function as a check and balance on the financial system. Not unlike regulation checks uh, excess lending, a credit default swap functions the same way, um, whereas if you were to borrow too much or overspend as a sovereign country and somebody has a default swap on your debt, that would you know provide uh, a reverse center for, for that bar to take place in the first place. So if your point is that we shouldn't just kind of shut this market down, that we should try and understand the, its economic function, um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I think probably uh, the press has tried to find some easy villains. And here you've got these complicated credit default swaps. Um, so they're, they're an, easy, an easy target. Um, 
I think that uh, they're a, a target because, in part, the, the trading of them was so disorderly. And um, so, yes, I think if you can prove the trading of them and, and you know, they do play an economic function and, and it shouldn't, we shouldn't just regulate them out of existence. And you can say the same thing about the housing bonds, for example. I just find it interesting that, you know, as a credit the false bonds is concerned compared to some of the housing products, it's really, a, on a financial scale, pretty, pretty basic stuff. I mean, they're all different, you know, I'll give you that, but the, their basic function as credit insurance is somewhat simple on the kind of scheme of as compared to some of the more exotic mortgage divisions or something like that. That's right. How much, you know, if you have a very small market share and then it, it blows up, um, maybe it doesn't cause a problem, maybe it does. And I think you know, we still don't have a, a firm idea of exactly what caused the, the financial crisis. I mean, the chairman said that in hindsight, letting Lehman Brothers fail was maybe a mistake. Well, again, this is an example where you can't run an experiment. We can't turn back time and say, okay, let, let's, let's intervene. <coughs> Maybe if they had to intervene, we still would have seen the subsequent events. It's gotten, um, that, that event has been thought of as, in a certain way, as being, you know, what precipitated this subsequent set of events. But maybe if Lehman hadn't failed and had, there had been intervention, maybe these other events would have happened anyway. So we don't know. Um, I just had one question regarding the um, game scenario. Yeah. Um, you mentioned really quick that um, the total um, social benefit was maximized when the Fed kept the money supply constant. And firms didn't raise and prices. And firms didn't raise prices. Why then, is, if the purpose of the Fed is to maximize social benefit, then why would the Fed have the incentive to begin with to raise the money supply? Because I think in that example it would lower unemployment. Right, but so if the Fed has a dual mandate to keep inflation low and unemployment low, it sees an opportunity to lower unemployment, it may take that. Right, then at the same time, why would social benefit be maximized at a point where unemployment is greater than an option B? I, I, those numbers were made up to illustrate certain points. Um, just the idea that uh, if you have unemployment below the natural rate, that probably is setting up an inflationary cycle because eventually you, you return to that natural rate of unemployment. So that would be a temporary gain. Okay. We're, we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you.